Hello there. Good evening. A very warm welcome to the beginning, part one of this wonderful classic piece of English literature, Charles Dickens's Oliver Twist. Not to overstate it, but maybe arguably one of the most classic bits of English literature. It's uh, a favourite across the world. Everyone, I'm sure, has seen some film adaptation, but I've never read the original text, and so I'm very much looking forward to beginning that. Again, hello, welcome everyone, it's lovely to see you. It's Sunday night, so let's let's get into it. I mean, I'm really looking forward to what this book has in store for us, because as we've seen over the last year and many of the live reads we've done with these wonderful classic texts, there's so much more substance in the original book than there could ever be in any of the films, and I have no doubt that Charles Dickens's Oliver Twist will be the same. I'm going to get to the chat in a moment, but before we begin, if you're new to Book Club, be sure to subscribe because this is what we do at Book Club. The other week, I put a poll up on the channel. What should we read next? I do these regularly whenever we're deciding what book to read next. And as you can see, it was a very popular poll, 134 votes. And 50% of those 134 wanted to hear and to have read to them and to listen to Oliver Twist. And so here we are with Oliver Twist. This is what we do Whenever there's a, a void as to what book we read next, I put a poll up with a choice of four normally. Everyone votes. The winner is what we read. If there's two that are very close, I'll often read both of them. And so before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about this wonderful classic piece of English literature. The story of the orphan Oliver who runs away from the workhouse to be taken in by a den of thieves. Shocked readers with its depiction of a dark criminal underworld peopled by vivid and memorable characters. The arch-villain Fagin, the artful Dodger, the menacing Bill Sykes and the prostitute Nancy. Combining elements of gothic romance, the Newgate novel and popular melodrama. Oliver Twist created an entirely new kind of fiction, scathing in its indictment of a cruel society and pervaded by an unforgettable sense of threat and mystery. And don't forget, this would have been published, first, um, first published in 1837. Goodness me, it's an old book, 1837. Pretty sensational at the time, I would imagine and um, still current today. Let me read a bit more about it. Dive into the heart of Victorian London with Charles Dickens's Oliver Twist, a masterpiece that descends mere storytelling. This gripping tale of an orphan navigating the treacherous underbelly of society exposes the stark realities of 19th century life through vivid characters like those I've just mentioned. Oliver Twist is a powerful critique of social injustice, blending gothic romance with a profound moral compass. Embark on this literary journey with us here at Book Club, where Dickens not only entertains but enlightens, urging us to reflect on the essence of humanity and the forces of society. Oliver Twist isn't just a book, it's an experience that challenges, charms and changes us. Listen to this timeless classic and let it awaken your heart and mind to the enduring struggles and triumphs of the human spirit. So, goodness me, hopefully it lives up to all that hype. If you're looking forward to Oliver Twist, Beelzebub's Tales and Walden, all of which we will be reading, uh, we'll be um, going between them. If you're looking forward to all of that, please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you've not done so yet. Consider sharing the show with your like-minded friends. And just very quickly, the app. It continues to grow, to thrive, and people are very much enjoying it. I've just added part two of Wind in the Willows, another fairy tale, and a roll doll. And I continue to upload, um, yeah, regularly. And so if you are fond of Oliver Twist or any of the other readings on the channel, then you can become a member, sign up, the link's in the description, request Oliver Twist or any of the other 
uh, your, all your favorites and I'll upload it right away for you. So let me just say hello to all the clubbers in the chat. There was some other comments from a long time ago that have been removed now. So obviously, I'm sorry, I can't remember those. I didn't note them down. But uh, hello there, Caroline, who's here. Soul Sister, Sully Cantar or the Cantar family, if you're all listening. Uh, Jack Daniel says, uh, I was invited for dinner, so I won't be here. But uh, hello on the Catch Up crew, if you're watching on Catch Up. Jack Daniels and haven't skipped through the introduction. Hello there. Uh, Donna Harper's here, says, good evening, ladies and gents. Let's all enjoy a bit of Sunday night Dickens. So welcome, Donna. Nice to see you. The Websters are here. Hello, Websters. El Tell says, hey, everyone. Hope you're all well. Um, Narissa Nolan says, morning. I finally get to hear you speak live. Currently in hospital, so I'm glad to hear Lewis. You cheer me up a lot. Well, get well soon, Narissa. I hope it's nothing too serious and glad that you've got a good internet connection in hospital so sorry to hear that and get well soon sean says hello michelle says hello listening with liana and alania a shout out would be amazing so there you go hello there michelle liania and Ala elena i think maybe sorry if i've mispronounced them forgive me but hello guys welcome um Donna says this has a Jane Eyre essence to it and that was written in 1847 so yes I think you're right Donna. Nathan J says or even Alice hi Alice and the Websters say hi Lewis so hello there Websters hello everyone and with all that out the way I hope I've whetted your appetite and I don't know how long we're going to read for it's going to be a long book many sittings but we will read many chapters this evening get into a nice little flow and we'll be back tomorrow monday night for some more so oliver twist or the parish boys progress by charles dickens book the first chapter the first treats of the place where oliver twist was born and of the circumstances attending his birth the Websters, the app, you have to click the link in the description. If you go into the description, it's the top link. Or after the description, join the book club audiobook app. Click that. It will take you to Patreon who host it and you can sign up very easily. Chapter the first treats of the place where Oliver Twist was born and of the circumstances attending his birth. Among other public buildings in the town of Mudfog, it boasts of one which is common to most towns, great or small, to wit, a workhouse. And in this workhouse there was born on a day and date which I need not trouble myself to repeat, inasmuch as it can be of no possible consequence to the reader, in this stage of the business at all events, the item of mortality whose name is prefixed to the head of this chapter. For a long time after he was ushered into this world of sorrow and trouble by the parish surgeon, it remained a matter of considerable doubt whether the child would survive to bear any name at all, in which case it is somewhat more than probable that these memoirs would never have appeared, or if they had, being comprised within a couple of pages, they would have possessed the inestimable merit of being the most concise and faithful specimen of biography extant in the literature of any age or country. Although I am not disposed to maintain that the being born in a workhouse is in itself the most fortunate and enviable circumstance that can possibly befall a human being, I do mean to say that in this particular instance it was the best thing for Oliver Twist that could by possibility have occurred. The fact is that there was considerable difficulty in inducing Oliver to take upon himself the office, the office of respiration, a troublesome practice, but one which custom has rendered necessary to our easy existence. And for some time he lay gasping on a little flock mattress, rather unequally poised between this world and the next, the balance being decidedly in favour of the latter. Now, if during this brief period Oliver had been surrounded by careful grandmothers, anxious aunts, experienced nurses and doctors of profound wisdom, he would most inevitably and indubitably have been killed in no time. 
There being nobody by, however, but a pauper old woman who was rendered rather misty by an unwanted allowance of beer and a parish surgeon who did such matters by contract, Oliver and Nature fought out the point between them. The result was that, after a few struggles, Oliver breathed, sneezed, and proceeded to advertise to the inmates of the workhouse the fact of a new burden having been imposed upon the parish by setting up as loud a cry as could reasonably have been expected from a male infant who had not been possessed of that very useful appendage, a voice, for much longer space of time than three minutes and a quarter. As Oliver gave this first testimony of the free and proper action of his lungs, the patchwork coverlet, which was carelessly flung over the iron bedstead, rustled. The pale face of a young female was raised feebly from the pillow, and a faint voice imperfectly articulated the words, Let me see the child and die. The surgeon had been sitting with his face turned downwards towards the fire, giving the palms of his hands a warm and a rub alternately. But as the young woman spoke, he rose, and, advancing to the bed's head, said with more kindness than might have been expected of him, "'Oh, you must not talk about dying yet.' "'Lord bless her dear heart, no,' interposed the nurse, hastily depositing in her pocket a green glass bottle, the contents of which she had been tasting in a corner with evident satisfaction." Law bless her dear art, when she has lived as long as I have, sir, and had thirteen children of her own, and all of em dead except two, and them in the workus with me, she'll know better than to take on in that way, bless her dear art. Think what it is to be a mother. There's a dear young lamb do. Apparently this consolatory perspective of a mother's prospects failed in producing its due effect. The patient shook her head and stretched out her hand towards the child. <laughs> the surgeon deposited it in her arms. She imprinted her cold white lips passionately on its forehead, passed her hands over her face, gazed wildly round, shuddered, fell back, and died. They chafed her breast, hands, and temples, but the blood had frozen for ever. They talked of hope and comfort. They had been strangers too long. "'It's all over, Mrs. Thingummy,' said the surgeon at last. "'Ah, oh, poor dear, so it is,' said the nurse, "'picking up the cork of the green bottle "'which had fallen out on the pillow as she stopped, "'as she stooped to take up the child. "'Poor dear! "'You needn't mind sending up to me if the child cries, nurse,' "'said the surgeon, putting on his gloves with great deliberation. "'It's very likely it will be troublesome. "'Give it a little gruel if it is.' He put on his hat, and, pausing by the side bed, by the bedside on his way to the door, added, She was a good-looking girl, too. Where did she come from? She was brought here last night, replied the old woman, by the overseer's order. She was found lying in the street. She had walked some distance, for her shoes were worn to pieces, but where she came from, or where she was going to, nobody knows. The surgeon leant over the body, and raised the left hand. The old story he said, shaking his head. No wedding ring, I see. Ah, good night. The medical gentleman walked away to dinner, and the nurse, having once more applied herself to the green bottle, sat down on a low chair before the fire, and proceeded to dress the infant. And what an excellent example of the power of dress young Oliver Twist was. Wrapped in the blanket which had hitherto formed his only covering, he might have been the child of a nobleman or a beggar, it would have been hard for the haughtiest stranger to have fixed his society, his station in society. But now he was enveloped in the old calico robes that had grown yellow in the same service. He was badged and ticketed and fell into his place at once, a parish child, the orphan of a workhouse, the humble, half-starved drudge, to be cuffed and buffeted through the world, despised by all and pitied by none. Oliver cried lustily, if he could have known that he was an orphan left to the tender mercies of church wardens and overseers, perhaps he would have cried the louder. <laughs> wow, what an introduction. Welcome to the world, Oliver Twist. Welcome to the world. Welcome to the world, Oliver. And what writing, 
what writing he um <laughs> Dickens. Sorry everyone, I'm just reveling reveling in that writing um <laughs> and how wonderful it is. Uh and yeah, I'll try and read the chapter and then come back to the chat to keep the flow going as best I can. I, I'm not promising anything, but I will try my best and I'm sorry to hear about your fibromyalgia, Narissa. Uh I hope the the book eases the pain somewhat and that the doctors eve it um alleviate it even further. Uh so yeah, have a look the Webster's. There's a quite a large library, so See if there's anything that tickles your fancy and sign up if you can. Uh, Woody B's here. Hello, clubbers, said Woody B. Did I miss a lot? Uh, we've just started, as Soul Sister says. We've just finished the first chapter, and it's a wonderful opening chapter um, where Oliver's born, his mother's died, and he's thrust into the, the world of suffering, I suppose, of Victorian London. And it's just the start. Uh, John Godfrey's here, says, hi, everyone. Brian says, I can't believe I've been listening for so long, 99% catch up and totally neglected to sign up for the app. Finally did it just now, my bad. So Brian Carey, that's very kind of you, my friend. I appreciate everyone who signs up. And of course, there's a lot of value there because I'm not going to go into it now, but go and listen yourself. Um, and Brian, be sure to let me know which book you would like me to add for you. FG is here, says, hello, been busy with HWS and studies. Glad I have an opportunity to hear you now. Love the story. I'm happy to have you here. FG, welcome. And let's continue. Oh, Dave's here as well, says, oh, hey, y'all. Hello, Dave. And Laurie says, hello, clubbers. What a heartbreaking beginning. And Laurie, it's only the beginning. We've got a hell of a long way to go and a fair bit of suffering, I would imagine. So the second chapter's a bit longer than the first, so I can't promise I won't be dipping back into the chat, forgive me. But um, John says, I love Dickens and his books. Um, and Woody B says, yeah, John, if you haven't seen it, John Godfrey a Christmas Carol is on the channel, so if you want to listen to it on the channel, it's there. If you want to listen to it on Lewis Kirk, you can read it with the text. Or if you want to hear it on the app, it's on the app as well. So, spoil it for choice. And Woody B says, not bad, Soul Sister, but a lot of things going on. It's hard to catch up to everything. And that's right, Woody B, we have to prioritise and, yeah, stick to those because... There's too much content, but I'm glad to have you all here, and let's continue. Chapter the Second Treats of Oliver Twist's Growth, Education, and Board For the next eight or ten months, Oliver was the victim of a systematic course of treachery and deception. He was brought up by hand. The hungry and destitute situation of the infant orphan was duly reported by the workhouse authorities to the parish authorities. The parish authorities inquired with dignity of the workhouse authorities whether there was no female then domiciled in the house who was in a situation to impart to Oliver Twist the consolation and nourishment of which he stood in need. The workhouse authorities replied with humility that there was not. Upon this, the parish authorities magnanimously and humanely resolved that Oliver should be farmed or, in other words, that he should be dispatched to a branch workhouse some three miles off, where twenty or thirty other juvenile offenders against the poor laws rolled about the floor all day without the inconvenience of too much food or too much clothing, under the parental superintendence of an elderly female who received the culprits at and for the consideration of seven pence half penny per small head per week. Seven pence half pennies worth per week is a good round diet for a child. A great deal may be got for seven pence half penny, quite enough to overload its stomach and make it uncomfortable. The elderly female was a woman of wisdom and experience. She knew what was good for children, and she had a very accurate perception of what was good for herself. 
So she appropriated the greater part of the weekly stipend to her own use and consigned the rising parochial generation to even a shorter allowance than was originally provided for them, thereby finding in the lowest depth a deeper still, and providing herself a very great experimental philosopher. I'll read that again because I um, messed it up. Hello there, Paddy. Uh, I'll be back in the comments shortly. I'm going to read that again because I feel, well, I messed it up. So she appropriated the greater part of the weekly stipend to her own use and consigned the rising parochial generation to even a shorter allowance than was originally provided for them, thereby finding in the lowest depth a deeper still and proving herself a very great experimental philosopher. Everybody knows the story of another experimental philosopher who had a great theory about a horse being able to live without eating and who demonstrated it so well that he got his own horse down to a straw a day and would most unquestionably have rendered him a very spirited and rampacious animal upon nothing at all if he hadn't died just four and twenty hours before he was to have had his first comfortable bait of air. Unfortunately for the experimental philosophy of the female to whose protecting care Oliver Twist was delivered over, a similar result usually attended the operation of her system. For just at the very moment when a child had contrived to exist upon the smallest possible portion of the weakest possible food, it did perversely happen in eight and a half cases out of ten, either that it sickened from want and cold, or fell into the fire from neglect, or got smothered by accident, in any one of which cases the miserable little being was usually summoned into another world, and there gathered to the fathers which it had never known in this. <laughs> what a phrase what a phrase that was goodness me sickened from want or cold fell into the fire from neglect or got smothered by accident <laughs> I suppose we should all be grateful that we're um, I suppose we have our own troubles in 2024 but in 1850 it sounds like you did well to get to your 10th birthday. Occasionally, when there was some more than usually interesting inquest upon a parish child who had been overlooked in turning up a bedstead or inadvertently schooled it to death when there happened to be a washing, though the latter accident was very scarce, anything approaching to a washing being of rare occurrence in the farm. The jury would take it into their heads to ask troublesome questions, or the parishioners would rebelliously affix their signatures to a remonstrance, but these impertinences were speedily checked by the evidence of the surgeon and the testimony of the beadle, the former of whom had always opened the body and found nothing inside, which was very probable indeed and the latter of whom invariably swore whatever the parish wanted, which was very self-devotional. Besides, the board made periodical pilgrimage to the farm and always sent the beadle the day before to say they were coming. The children were neat and clean to behold when they went, and what more would the people have? It cannot be expected that this system of farming would produce any very extraordinary or luxuriant crop. Oliver Twist's eight, eighth birthday found him pale, thin, oh sorry, found him a... Oh, hello there, Nick Cooper. Welcome. Never missed anyone else. Oh, Paddy's here. Uh, Paddy's happy that I'm reading Dickens. Well, I'm happy that you enjoy me bringing the books to life, Paddy. And yes, you're right. Uh, it's not the easiest of reads, so relax and enjoy. So where were we? It's his eighth birthday. Let me start that one again. Yeah, welcome Nick Cooper. Happy St. Paddy's Day, whenever that was. <laughs> it cannot be expected that this system of farming would produce any vex very extraordinary or luxuriant crop. Oliver Twist's eighth birthday found him a pale, thin child, somewhat diminutive in stature and decidedly small in circumference. 
but nature or inheritance had implanted a good, sturdy spirit in Oliver's breast. It had had plenty of room to expand, thanks to the spare diet of the establishment, and perhaps to this circumstance may be attributed his having any eighth birthday at all. Be this as it may, however, it was his eighth birthday, and he was keeping it in the coal cellar with a select party of two other young gentlemen who, after participating with him in a sound threshing, had been locked up therein for atrociously presuming to be hungry, when Mrs. Mann, the good lady of the house, was unexpectedly startled by the apparition of Mr. Bumble, the beadle, striving to undo the wicket of the garden gate. "'Goodness gracious, is that you, Mr. Bumble, sir?' said Mrs. Mann, thrusting her head out of the window in well-affected ecstasies of joy. "'Susan, take Oliver and them two brats upstairs and wash em directly. My heart alive, Mr. Bumble, how glad I am to see you, surely!' Now, Mr. Bumble was a fat man, and a choleric one, so, instead of responding to this open-hearted salutation in a kindred spirit, he gave the little wicket a tremendous shake, and then bestowed upon it a kick which could have emanated from no leg but a beadle's. Lor, only think, said Mrs. Mann, running out, for the three boys had been removed by this time, only think of that, that I should have forgotten that the gate was bolted on the inside, on account of them dear children. Walk in, sir, walk in, pray, Mr. Bumble, do, sir. Although this invitation was accompanied with a curtsy that might have softened the heart of a church warden, it by no means mollified the beadle. Do you think this respectful or proper conduct, Mrs. Mann, inquired Mr. Bumble, grasping his cane, to keep the parish officers awaiting at your garden gate when they come here upon parochial business connected with the parochial orphans? Are you aware, Mrs. Mann, that you are, as I say, a parochial delegate and a stipendiary? I'm sure, Mr. Bumble, that I was only a-telling one or two of the dear children, as is so fond of you, that it was you a-coming, replied Mrs. Mann, with great humility. Mr. Bumble had a great idea of his oratorical powers and his importance. He had displayed the one and vindicated the other. He relaxed. Well, well, Mrs. Mann, he replied in a calmer tone. It may be, as you say, it may be. Lead the way in, Mrs. Mann, for I come on business and have got something to say. Mrs. Mann ushered the beadle into a small parlour with a brick floor, placed a seat for him, and officiously deposited his cocked hat and cane on the table before him. Mr. Bumble wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his walk had engendered, glanced complacently at the cocked hat, and smiled. Yes, he smiled. Beadles are but men, and Mr. Bumble smiled. Now, don't you be offended at what I'm going to say observed Mrs. Mann, with captivating sweetness. You've had a long walk, you know, or I wouldn't mention it. Now, will you take a little drop of something, Mr. Bumble? Not a drop, not a drop, said Mr. Bumble, waving his right hand in a dignified but still placid manner. I think you will, said Mrs. Mann, who had noticed the tone of the refusal and the gesture that had accompanied it. Just a little drop, with a little cold water and a lump of sugar? Mr. Bumble coughed. "'Now, just a little drop,' said Mrs. Mann, persuasively. "'What is it?' inquired the beadle. "'Why, it's what I'm obliged to keep a little of in the house, "'to put in the blessed infant's daffy when they ain't well, Mr. Bumble,' "'replied Mrs. Mann as she opened a corner cupboard "'and took down a bottle and glass. "'It's gin.' "'Do you give the children daffy, Mrs. Mann?' inquired Bumble, "'following with his eyes the interesting process of mixing.' "'Ah, oh, bless em, that I do, dear as it is,' replied the nurse. "'I couldn't see him suffer before my very eyes, you know, sir.' "'No,' said Mr. Bumble approvingly. "'No, you could not. "'You are a humane woman, Mrs. Mann.' "'Here she set down the glass. "'I shall take an early opportunity of mentioning it to the board, Mrs. Mann.' "'He drew it towards him. "'You feel as a mother, Mrs. Mann.' "'He stirred the gin and water. "'I, I drink your health with cheerfulness, Mrs. Mann.' and he swallowed half of it. "'And now about business,' said the beadle, taking out a leathern pocket-book. "'The child that was half-baptised, Oliver Twist, is eight years old to-day.' "'Bless him,' interposed Mrs. Mann, inflaming her left eye with the corner of her apron. 
and notwithstanding an offered reward of ten pound which was afterwards increased to twenty pound, notwithstanding the most superlative and, I may say, supernatural exertions on the part of this parish, said Mr. Bumble, we have never been able to discover who is his father or what is his mother's settlement, name or condition. <laughs> <coughs> so yeah mr man or mrs man sorry mr bumble let me just say hello to everyone uh, coming in otherwise i won't ever be able to catch up um uh, yes donna it's uh, very sad the the history of england and i mean the saddest still is that some children still live in the similar sort of poverty so yeah uh, i suppose again gratitude and luck has brought us where we are in this world that we can have the technology and the time and the leisure to enjoy all this together so <laughs> paddy says st patrick's day is like a second birthday for him and i imagine with a name like that paddy uh st patrick would have been proud so <laughs> i'm glad you're enjoying yourself uh catherine says hey lewis and all i'm late how is everyone hi there Catherine. we've just started so welcome um uh, donna says they photographed the dead in those days uh very macabre era in time was the victorian periods uh yes for sure it was um donna says they believed the soul lived on when captured photographically or in photograph casket to buy i lived opposite a cemetery growing up and and not to digress too quickly, but just on that comment of Donna, that certain archaic tribes, tribes that haven't found the modern world, they wouldn't allow modern Westerners to take pictures of them because they felt that sort of the picture would have some sort of hold over their soul as well. So there's definitely something to pictures. And now we're snapping and uploading videos. I mean, I shouldn't be talking to them. Uh, streaming live here reading so does my soul come across I don't know but anyway we, we won't get into a discussion about the soul and its capture in digital form right now maybe another day uh, hello Zhuang Li I think that's how you pronounce it that's how I'm my, my best effort Zhuang Li I'm so glad to hear Dickens read aloud I find his realism hard to read myself he's one of the best thank you you're very welcome and um, Laurie um, responds to Donna and Kantar family. Look at that. How very generous Sully Kantar and whoever else is there of the Kantar family uh, says um, just a small thank you for what you do. And is very much appreciated. Kantar family. Thank you very much. Um, that's another way you can support guys as well as liking and subscribing and sharing the show the app you can also do super chats and super stickers i don't i should mention it much more regularly really but i don't know why i don't but you can as you see in the chat the Kantar family has thanked me with a small donation and i very much appreciate that so thank you very much the chat's all caught up with now back to the story <clears throat> Mrs. Mann raised her hands in astonishment, but added, after a moment's reflection, How comes he to have any name at all, then? The beadle drew himself up with great pride and said, I invented it. You, Mr. Bumble, I, Mrs. Mann, we name our foundlings in alphabetical order. The last was an S, Swabble, I named him. This was T, Twist, I named him. The next one, as comes, will be Unwin, and the next, Vilkins. I have got names ready to the end of the alphabet, and all the way through, a, through it again when we come to Z. Why, you're quite a literary character, sir, said Mrs. Mann. Well, well, said the beadle, evidently gratified with the compliment. Perhaps I may be, perhaps I may be, Mrs. Mann. He finished the gin and water and added, Oliver, being now too old to remain here, the board have determined to have him back into the house, and I have come out myself to take care of him. So let me see him at once. 
I'll fetch him directly, said Mrs. Mann, leaving the room for that purpose, and Oliver, having by this time had as much of the outer coat of dirt, which encrusted his face and hands removed as could be scrubbed off in one washing, was led into the room by his benevolent protectress. <clears throat> make a bow to the gentleman oliver said mrs mann oliver made a bow which was divided between the beadle on the chair and the cocked hat on the table will you go along with me oliver said mr bumble in a majestic voice oliver was about to say that he would go along with anybody with great readiness when glancing upwards he caught sight of mrs mann who had got behind the beadle's chair and was shaking her fist at him with a furious countenance he took the hint at once for the fist had been too often impressed upon his body not to be deeply impressed upon his recollection will she go with me inquired poor oliver no she can't replied mr bumble but she'll come out and see you sometimes this was no very great consolation to the child but young as he was he had sense enough to make a feint of feeling great regret at going away it was no very difficult matter for the boy to cool the tears into his eyes hunger and recent ill-usage are great assistance if you want to cry and oliver cried very naturally indeed mrs mann gave him a thousand embraces and what oliver wanted a great deal more a piece of bread and butter lest he should seem too hungry when he got to the workhouse with the slice of bread in his hand and the little brown cloth parish cap upon his head oliver was then led away by mr bumble from the wretched home where one kind word or look had never lighted the gloom of his infant years and yet he burst into an agony of childish grief as the cottage gate closed after him wretched as were the little companions in misery he was leaving behind they were the only friends he had ever known and a sense of his loneliness in the great wide world sank into the child's heart for the first time mr bumble walked on with long strides and little oliver firmly grasping the gold-laced cuff trotted beside him inquiring at the end of a quarter of every quarter of a mile whether they were nearly there to which interrogations mr bumble returned very brief and snappish replies for the temporary blandness which gin and water awakens in some bosoms had by this time evaporated and he was once again a beadle oliver had not been within the walls of the workhouse a quarter of an hour and had scarcely completed the demolition of a second slice of bread when mr bumble who had handed him over to the care of an old woman returned and telling him it was a bored night informed him that the board had said he was to appear before it forthwith not having a very clearly defined notion of what a live board was oliver was rather astounded by this intelligence and was not quite certain whether he ought to laugh or cry he had no time to think about the matter however for mr bumble gave him a tap on the head with his cane to wake him up and another on the back to make him lively and bidding him follow conducted him into a large whitewashed room where eight or ten fat gentlemen were sitting round a table at the top of which seated in an armchair rather higher than the rest was a particularly fat gentleman with a very round red face <laughs> bow to the board said bumble oliver brushed away two or three tears that were lingering in his eyes and seeing no board but a table fortunately bowed to that <laughs> what's your name boy said the gentleman in the high chair oliver was frightened at the sight of so many gentlemen which made him tremble and the beadle gave him another tap behind which made him cry and these two causes made him answer in a very low and hesitating voice whereupon a gentleman in a white waistcoat said he was a fool which was a capital way of raising his spirits and putting him quite at his ease boy said the gentleman in a high in the high chair listen to me you know you're an orphan i suppose what's that sir inquired poor oliver the boy is a fool i thought he was said the gentleman in the white waistcoat in a very decided tone 
If one member of a class be blessed with an intuitive perception of others of the same race, the gentleman in the white waistcoat was unquestionably well qualified to pronounce an opinion on the matter. Hush, said the gentleman who had spoken first. You know you've got no father or mother, and that you are brought up by the parish, don't you? Yes, sir, replied Oliver, weeping bitterly. What are you crying for? inquired the gentleman in the white waistcoat, and to be sure it was very extraordinary, what could he be crying for? I hope you say your prayers every night, said another gentleman in a gruff voice, and pray for the people who feed you and take care of you like a Christian. Yes, sir, stammered the boy. The gentleman who spoke last was unconsciously right. It would have been very like a Christian, and a marvellously good Christian too, if Oliver had prayed for the people who fed and took care of him, but he hadn't because nobody had taught him. Well, you have come here to be educated and taught a useful trade, said the red-faced gentleman in the high chair. So you'll begin to pick oakum tomorrow morning at six o'clock, added the surly one in the white waistcoat. For the combination of both these blessings in the one simple process of picking oakum, Oliver bowed low by the direction of the beadle and was then hurried away to a large ward where, on a rough hard bed, he sobbed himself to sleep. What a noble illustration of the tender laws of this favoured country. They let the paupers go to sleep. Poor Oliver. He little thought as he lay sleeping in happy unconsciousness of all around him that the board had that very day arrived at a decision which would exercise the most material influence over all his future fortunes. But they had, and this was it. The members of this board were very sage, deep, philosophical men, and when they came to turn their attention to the workhouse, they found out at once what ordinary folks would never have discovered. The poor people liked it. It was a regular place of public entertainment for the poorer classes, a tavern where there was nothing to pay, a public breakfast, dinner, tea and supper all the year round, a brick and mortar elysium where it was all play and no work. Oh-ho, said the board, looking very knowing. We are the fellows to set this rights. We'll stop it at no time. So they'll establish the rule that all poor people should have the alternative, for they would compel nobody, not they, of being starved by a gradual process in the house or by a quick one out of it. With this view, they contracted with the waterworks to lay on an unlimited supply of water and with a corn factor to supply periodically small quantities of oatmeal and issued three meals of thin gruel a day with an onion twice a week and half a roll on Sundays. They made a great many other wise and humane regulations having reference to the ladies which it is not necessary to repeat kindly undertook to divorce poor married people in consequence of the great expense of a suit in doctor's commons, and instead of compelling a man to support his family as they had theretofore done, took his family away from him and made him a bachelor. There is no telling how many applicants for relief under these last two heads would not have started up in all classes of society if it had not been coupled with the workhouse but they were long-headed men and they had provided for this difficulty the relief was inseparable from the workhouse and the gruel and the frightened people <laughs> hello there ayush ayush you've just come to the book club so welcome and hello there For the first three months after Oliver Twist was removed, the system was in full operation. It was rather expensive at first in consequence of the increase in the undertaker's bill and the necessity of taking in the clothes of all the paupers which fluttered loosely on their wasted, shrunken forms after a week or two's gruel. But the number of workhouse inmates got thin as well as the paupers and the board were in ecstasies. The room in which the boys were fed was a large stone hall with a copper at one end, out of which the master, dressed in an apron for the purpose and assisted by one or two women, ladled the gruel at meal times, of which composition each boy had one porringer and no more, except on festive occasions, and then he had two ounces and a quarter of bread besides. 
The bowls never wanted washing. The boys polished them with their spoons till they shone again. And when they had performed this operation, which never took very long, the spoons being nearly as large as the bowls, they would sit staring at the copper with such eager eyes as if they would devour the very bricks of which it was composed, employing themselves, meanwhile, in sucking their fingers most assiduously with the view of catching up any stray splashes of gruel that might have been cast thereon. Boys have generally excellent appetites. Oliver Twist and his companions suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months. At last they got so voracious and wild with hunger that one boy, who was tall for his age and hadn't been used to that sort of thing, for his father had kept a small cook-shop, hinted darkly to his companions that unless he had another basin of gruel per diem, he was afraid he should some night eat the boy who, who slept next to him, who happened to be a weakly youth of tender age. He had a wild, hungry eye, and they implicitly believed him. A council was held, lots were cast who should walk up to the master after supper that evening and ask for more, and it fell to Oliver Twist. Of course, a very famous scene that I think we're going to um, come to now very early, and just in chapter two, I suppose the most famous scene in the book happens in chapter two. <clears throat> the evening arrived. The boys took their places. The master, in his cook's uniform, stationed himself at the copper. His pauper assistants ranged themselves behind him. The gruel was served out, and a long grace was said over the short commons. The gruel disappeared, and the boys whispered each other and winked at Oliver, while his next neighbours nudged him. Child as he was, he was desperate with hunger and reckless with misery. He rose from the table and, advancing, basin and spoon in hand, to the master said, somewhat alarmed at his own temerity, "'Please, sir, I want some more.' The master was a fat, healthy man, but he turned very pale. He gazed in stupefied astonishment on the small rebel for some seconds, and then clung for support to the copper. The assistants were paralysed with wonder, and the boys with fear. "'What?' said the master at length in a faint voice. "'Please, sir,' replied Oliver, "'I want some more.' The master aimed a blow at Oliver's head with the ladle, pinioned him in his arms, and shrieked aloud for the beadle. The board were sitting in solemn conclave when Mr. Bade, when Mr. Bumble rushed into the room in great excitement and, addressing the gentleman in the high chair, said, "'Mr. Limpkins, I beg your pardon, sir. Oliver Twist has asked for more.' There was, was a general start. Horror was depicted on in every countenance. "'For more?' said Mr. Limpkins. "'Compose yourself, Bumble, and answer me distinctly. Do I understand that he asked for more after he had eaten the supper allotted by the dietary?' "'He did, sir,' replied Bumble. "'That boy will be hung,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'I know that boy will be hung.' Nobody controverted the prophetic gentleman's opinion. An animated discussion took place. Oliver was ordered into instant confinement, and a bill was next morning pasted on the outside of the gate, offering a reward of five pounds to anybody who would take Oliver Twist off the hands of the parish. In other words, five pounds and Oliver Twist were offered to any man or woman who wanted an apprentice to any trade, business, or calling. "'I never was more convinced of anything in my life,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat as he knocked at the gate and read the bill the next morning. "'I never was more convinced of anything in my life than I am that that boy will come to be hung.' As I propose to show in the sequel whether the white-waistcoated gentleman was right or not, I should perhaps mar the interest of this narrative, supposing it to possess any at all, if I ventured to hint just yet whether the life of Oliver Twist will be a long or a short piece of biography. <laughs> that's chapter two, Dumb. And um, that's the thing, that they've changed it, haven't they? Um, in the films... It's, please, sir, may I have some more. That's right. Sully Cantor says, please, sir, may I have some more. But in the original book, it's, I want some more. Twice. Please, sir, I want some more. Please, sir, I want some more. So, I don't think I've ever seen a film 
where they say I want some more it's always can I have some more so why wouldn't they just have the original um why wouldn't they have the original what's the word um the original dialogue why wouldn't they just say I want some more and uh yes Donna I have sold my soul I'm here although it's one of my favorite things to do read live here with um with the clubbers and book club and especially these wonderful books that we're working through so although I may have sold my soul I got a good exchange rate <laughs> Um, Catherine considers cemeteries to be calming so um, I don't know if it's weird but unusual maybe uh, Paddy says Dickens wrote Oliver after the Poverty Act was introduced he used writing to illustrate how poverty leads to crime yeah well good point there Paddy and I think this was his second book I think if I remember rightly uh, Donna says all superstition has its air of truth. You'll find if you do if you dig a little. Similarly with fairy tales and nursery rhymes. Yes, uh, Ayush. Hello, I've just started listening to you, so welcome, Ayush, and I hope you're enjoying the stories. Sally Kantar says so far very interesting yet depressing. So yes, it is rather depressing, but it's life. You know, it's a. Uh, a real depiction of Victorian England. So, yeah, I suppose there there is a right, or we have a right to be a bit down and depressed by the lives that these people lived and thankful and grateful that our, um, what's the word, our ancestors managed to stay alive long enough to procreate so that here we are today. Uh, I can, uh, I don't know about Percy Jackson, Catherine, because it might be some copyright issues. So I'm sorry, but I don't think we'll be reading Percy Jackson because it's a little bit new, I think. Whereas Oliver Twist from 1837, it's outside of copyright. So um, hopefully we'll be okay. But let's continue. Chapter the third relates how Oliver Twist was very near getting a place which would not have been a sinecure. For a week after the commission of the impious and profane offence of asking for more, Oliver remained a close prisoner in the dark and solitary room to which he had been consigned by the wisdom and mercy of the board. It appears at first sight not unreasonable to suppose that if he had entertained a becoming feeling of respect for the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat, he would have established that sage individual's prophetic character once and for ever by tying one end of his pocket handkerchief to a hook in the wall and attaching himself to the other. To the performance of this feat, however, there was one obstacle namely that pocket handkerchiefs being decided articles of luxury had been for all future times and ages removed from the noses of paupers by the express order of the board in council assembled solemn, solemnly given and pronounced under their hands and seals. There was a still greater obstacle in Oliver's youth and childishness. He only cried bitterly all day, and when the long, dismal night came on, he spread his little hands before his eyes to shut out the darkness, and, crouching in the corner, tried to sleep ever and anon, waking with a start and tremble, and drawing himself closer and closer to the wall, as if to feel even its cold, hard surface were a protection in the gloom and loneliness which surrounded him. Back to Sully's um, comment. Depressing indeed. Let it not be supposed by the enemies of the system that during the period of his solitary incarceration Oliver was denied the benefit of exercise, the pleasure of society, or the advantages of religious consolation. As for exercise, it was nice cold weather, and he was allowed to perform his ablutions every morning under the pump in a stone yard in the presence of Mr. Bumble, who prevented his catching cold and caused a tingling sensation to pervade his frame by repeated applications of the cane. 
As for society, he was carried every other day into the hall where the boys dined, and there sociably flogged, as a public warning and example, and so far from being denied the advantages of religious consolation, he was kicked into the same apartment every evening at prayer time, and there permitted to listen to and console his mind with a general supplication of the boys, containing a special clause therein inserted by the authority of the board, in which they entreated to be made good, virtuous, contented, and obedient, and to be guarded from the sins and vices of Oliver Twist, whom the supplication distinctly set forth to be under the exclusive patronage and protection of the powers of wickedness, and an article direct from the manufactory of the devil himself. <laughs> I'll look into it, Catherine, and Catherine, Catherine with a K and Catherine with a C, I'll look into it and we'll see, but uh, no promises. <clears throat> and so, this is what they did, right? Oliver has digressed and dared to ask for more and to scare everyone. We should pay attention to this. We're learning a lot, even in chapter 3. They're beating him. Um, where do they beat him first? Oh, they beat him when he's getting washed in the cold stone pump. They beat him in the dining room to let everyone know you don't ask for more because this is what will happen. And then they, they've added a prayer in the at prayer time save me from the evil that oliver is um underneath or under the power of so yeah, pretty intense for a little eight-year-old it chanced one morning while oliver's affairs were in this auspicious and comfortable state that mr gamfield chimney sweeper was wending his way adown the high street deeply cogitating in his mind his ways and means of paying certain arrears of rent for which his landlord had become rather pressing mr gamfield's most sanguine calculation of funds could not raise them within full five pounds of the desired amount and in a species of arithmetical desperation he was alternately cudgelling his brains and his donkey when passing the workhouse his eyes encountered the bill on the gate woo said mr gamfield to the donkey or maybe whoa but it's two o's so i'm guessing it's woo said mr gamfield to the donkey the donkey was in a state of profound abstraction wondering probably whether he was destined to be reg regaled with a cabbage stalk or two when he had disposed of the two sacks of soot with which the little cart was laden so without noticing the word of command he jogged onwards mr gamfield growled a fierce imprecation to, on the donkey generally but more particularly on his eyes and running after him bestowed a blow on his head which would inevitably have beaten in any skull but a donkey's then catching hold of the bridle he gave his jaw a sharp wrench by way of gentle reminder that he was not his own master and having by these means turned him round he gave him another blow on the head just to stun him till he came back again and having done so walked up to the gate to read the bill the gentleman with the white waistcoat was standing at the gate with his hands behind him after having delivered himself of some profound sentiments in the boardroom having witnessed these little dispute between mr gamfield and the donkey he smiled joyously when that person came up to read the bill for he saw at once that mr gamfield was just exactly the sort of master oliver twist wanted mr gamfield smiled too as he perused the document for five pounds was just the sum he had been wishing for and as to the boy with which it was encumbered mr gamfield knowing that the dietary of the workhouse was well knew he would be a nice small pattern <laughs> just the very thing for register stoves so he spelt the bill through again from beginning to end and then touching his fur cap in token of humility accosted the gentleman in the white waistcoat this here boy sir what the parish wants to prentice said mr gamfield yes my man said the gentleman in the white waistcoat with a condescending smile 
What of him? If the parish would like him to learn a light, pleasant trade and a good, spectable chimney sweep in business, said Mr. Gamfield, I want's apprentice, and I'm ready to take him. Walk in, said the gentleman with the white waistcoat, and Mr. Gamfield, having lingered behind to give the donkey another blow on the head and another wrench of the jaw as a caution not to run away in his absence, followed the gentleman with the white waistcoat into the room where Oliver had first seen him. It's a nasty trade said Mr. Limpkins, when Gamfield had again stated his wish. Young boys have been smothered in chimneys before now, said another gentleman. That's because they damped the straw afore they lit it in the chimney and make them come down again, said Mr. Gamfield. That's all smoke and no blaze, whereas smoke ain't a no use at all in making a boy come down. It only sends him to sleep, and that's what he likes. Boys is very obstinate and very lazy, Jen. Gentlem, gentlemen, and there's nothing like a good hot blaze to make them come down with a run. It's humane too, gentlemen, because even if they've stuck in the chimney, roast in their feet makes them struggle to extricate themselves. The gentleman in the white waistcoat appeared very much amused with his explanation, but his mirth was speedily checked by a look from Mr. Limpkins. The board then proceeded to converse among themselves for a few minutes, but in so low a tone that the words saving of expenditure look well in the accounts, have a printed report published, were alone audible, and they only chanced to be heard on account of their being very frequently repeated with great emphasis. At length the whispering ceased, and the members of the board, having resumed their seats and their solemnity, Mr. Limpkin said, we have considered your proposition, and we don't approve of it. Not at all, said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. Decidedly not, added the other members. As Mr. Gamfield did happen to labour under the slight imputation of having bruised three or four boys to death already, it occurred to him that the board had perhaps, in some unaccountable freak, taken it into their heads that this extraneous circumstance ought to influence their proceedings. It was very unlike their general mode of doing business if they had, but still, as he had no particular wish to revive the rumour, he twisted his cap in his hands and walked slowly from the table. <coughs> so you won't let me have him, gentlemen, said Mr. Gamfield, pausing near the door. No, replied Mr. Limpkins, at least as it's a nasty business, we think you ought to take something less than the premium we offered. Oh, dearie me. They don't care if he kills him, it beats him to death. It's just about the five pounds. <clears throat> I'll read that again. So you won't let me have him, gentlemen, said Mr. Gamfield, pausing near the door. No, replied Mr. Limpkins. At least, as it's a nasty business, we think you ought to take something less than the premium we offered. Hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> Donna says how disgusting and I imagine Donna's referring to the conditions and the treatment of young Oliver Twist the Webster says really sobering books like these are sad but remind us to be grateful that's well said the Webster's and also um, yeah well, to be grateful. <laughs> I was going to try and say it in another word or another term, but that's essentially it. Modern life, although there's many other troubles and many other issues, most most of us, if you're here listening to Book Club, I would imagine you've got a full belly, a warm room and a roof over your head, and you're living better than Oliver Twist was. And if not... Well, I hope so. Um, Donna, it puts into perspective not to be so woeful in our own lives. And that's well said as well, Donna. Yeah, woeful. There's no, there's no reason really to be woeful or the down or depressed. So, but anyway, we won't digress into that. And um, Donna says, oh, great. Nobody's here. 
Sorry, I couldn't resist. And hello there, nobody. If you feel comfortable doing it, nobody, please let us know your real name because nobody, as Don has, uh, with all the jokes, has said, it's, it sounds a bit weird. So nobody, if you feel comfortable, let us know your real name or something else we can call you because nobody, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a negative. So White Dwarf says, this was such an important book. When Queen Victoria read it, she advised the Prime Minister of the time, Lord Melbourne, to read it. It did take some time for social change to actually occur, however. But this was the first book to reach high society that exposed the third world, like conditions that the lower classes endured. Well, that's very interesting there, White Dwarf. Thanks for sharing that. And let's see... Um, the board aren't willing to sell Oliver for five pounds, so they're going to do a bit of bargaining by the looks of it. Let's see what they end up selling him for. Mr. Gamfield's countenance brightened as, with a quick step, he returned to the table and said, What will you give, gentlemen? Come, don't be too hard on a poor man. What will you give? I should say three pound ten was plenty, said Mr. Limpkins. Ten shillings too much, said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. Come, said Gamfield. Say four pound, gentlemen, say four pound, and you got rid of him for good and all. There. Three pound ten, repeated Mr. Limpkins firmly. Come, I'll split the difference, gentlemen, urged Gamfield. Three pound fifteen. Not a farthing more, was the reply of Mr. Limpkins. You're desperate hard upon me, gentlemen, said Gamfield, wavering. Poo, poo, nonsense, said the, den said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. He'd be cheap with nothing at all as a premium. Take him, you silly fellow. He's just the boy for you. He wants to stick now and then. It'll do him good, and his board needn't come very expensive, for he hasn't been overfed since he was born. Ha, ha, ha. Mr. Gamfield gave an arch look at the faces round the table, and observing a smile on all of them, gradually broke into a smile himself. The bargain was made, and Mr. Bumble was at once instructed that Oliver Twist and his indentures were to be conveyed before the magistrate for signature and approval that very afternoon. In pursuance of this determination, little Oliver, to his excessive astonishment, was released from bondage and ordered to put himself into a clean shirt. He had hardly achieved this very unusual gymnastic performance when Mr. Bumble brought him with his own hands a basin of gruel and the holiday allowance of two ounces and a quarter of bread, at sight of which Oliver began to cry very piteously, thinking, not unnaturally, that the board must have determined to kill him for some useful purpose, or they never would have begun to fatten him up in this way. "'Don't make your eyes red, Oliver, but eat your food and be thankful.' said Mr. Bumble in a tone of impressive pomposity. You're a going to be made apprentice of, Oliver. Apprentice, sir, said the child, trembling. Yes, Oliver, said Mr. Bumble. The kind of blessing, the kind of... Oh, sorry. Yes, Oliver, said Mr. Bumble. The kind and blessed gentleman which is so many parents to you, Oliver, when you have none of your own, are a-going to prentice you and to set you up in life and make a man of you, although the expense to the parish is three pound ten. Three pound ten, Oliver, seventy shillings, one hundred and forty sixpences, and all for a naughty orphan which nobody can love. As Mr. Bumble paused to take a breath after l delivering this address in an awful voice, the tears rolled down the poor child's face, and he sobbed bitterly. Calm, said Mr. Bumble, somewhat less pompously, for it was gratifying to his feelings to observe the effect his eloquence had produced. Calm, Oliver, wipe your eyes with the cuffs of your jacket, and don't cry into your gruel. That's a very foolish action, Oliver. It certainly was, for there was quite enough water in it already. On their way to the magistrates, Mr. Bumble instructed Oliver that all he would have to do would be to look very happy and say, when the gentleman asked him if he wanted to be apprenticed, that he should like it very much indeed both of which injunctions Oliver promised to obey, the more readily as Mr. Bumble threw in a gentle hint that if he failed in either particular, there was no telling what would be done to him. 
When they arrived at the office, he was shut up in a little room by himself and admonished by Mr. Bumble to stay there until he came back to fetch him. There the boy remained with a palpitating heart for half an hour, at the expiration of which time Mr. Bumble thrust in his head, unadorned with the cocked hat, and said aloud, "'Now, Oliver, my dear, come to the gentleman.' As Mr. Bumble said this, he put on a grim and threatening look, and added in a low voice, "'Mind what I told you, you young rascal.' Oliver stared innocently in Mr. Bumble's face at this somewhat contradictory style of address, but that gentleman prevented his offering any remark thereupon by leading him at once into an adjoining room, the door of which was open. It was a large room with a great window, and behind a desk sat two old gentlemen with powdered heads, one of whom was reading the newspaper, while the other was perusing with the aid of a pair of tortoise-shell spectacles, a small piece of parchment which lay before him. L Mr. Limkins was standing in front of the desk on one side, and Mr. Gamfield with a partially washed face on the other, while two or three bluff-looking men in top boots were lounging about. The old gentleman with the spectacles gradually dozed off over the little bit of parchment, and there were, was a short pause after Oliver had been stationed by Mr. Bumble in front of the desk. "'This is the boy, your worship,' said Mr. Bumble. The old gentleman, who was reading the newspaper, raised his head for a moment, and pulled the other old gentleman by the sleeve, whereupon the last-mentioned old gentleman woke up. "'Oh, is this the boy?' said the old gentleman. "'This is him, sir,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'Bow to the magistrate, my dear.' Oliver roused himself and made his best obeisance. He had been wondering, with his eyes fixed on the magistrate's powder, whether all boards were born with that white stuff on their heads, and were boards from thenceforth on that account. "'Well,' said the old gentleman, "'I suppose he's fond of chimney-sweeping.' "'He dotes on it, your worship,' replied Bumble, giving Oliver a sly pinch to intimate that he had better not say he didn't. "'And he will be asleep, a sweep. "'And he will be a sweep, will he?' inquired the old gentleman. "'If we was to bind him to any other trade to-morrow, he'd run away simultaneously, your worship,' replied Bumble." "'And this man that's to be his master, you, sir, "'you'll treat him well and feed him and do all that sort of thing, will you?' "'said the old gentleman. "'When I says I will, I means I will,' replied Mr. Gamfield doggedly. "'You're a rough speaker, my friend, but you look an honest, open-hearted man,' "'said the old gentleman, turning his spectacles in the direction of the candidate "'for Oliver's premium, whose villainous countenance was a regular stamped receipt for cruelty.' but the magistrate was half blind and half childish, so he couldn't reasonably be expected to discern what other people did. "'I hope I am, sir,' said Mr. Gamfield, with an ugly leer. "'I have no doubt you are, my friend,' replied the old gentleman, fixing his spectacles more firmly on his nose, and looking about him for the inkstand. It was the critical moment of Oliver's fate. If the inkstand had been where the old gentleman thought it was, he would have dipped his pen into it and signed that the indentures and Oliver would have been straight away hurried off. But as it chanced to be immediately under his nose, it followed as a matter of course that he looked all over his desk for it without finding it, and happening in the course of his search to look straight before him, his gaze encountered the pale and terrified face of Oliver Twist, who, despite all the admonitory looks and pinches of Bumble, was regarding the very repulsive countenance of his future master with a mingled expression of horror and fear too palpable to be mistaken even by a half-blind magistrate. The old gentleman stopped, laid down his pen, and looked from Oliver to Mr. Limpkins, who attempted to take snuff with a cheerful and unconcerned aspect. "'My boy,' said the old gentleman, leaning over the desk. Oliver sta started at the sound. He might be excused for doing so, for the words were kindly said, and strange sounds frightened one. He trembled violently and burst into tears. "'My boy,' said the old gentleman, "'you look pale and alarmed. What is the matter?' "'Stand a little away from him, Beadle,' said the other magistrate, laying aside the paper and leaning forward with an expression of some interest. "'Now, boy, tell us what's the matter. Don't be afraid.' 
Oliver fell on his knees and, clasping his hands together, prayed that they would order him back to the dark room, that they would starve him, beat him, kill him if they pleased, rather than send him away with that dreadful man. Well, said Mr. Bumble, raising his hands and eyes with most impressive solemnity, well, of all the artful and designing orphans that ever I see, Oliver, you are one of the most barefaced or barefacedest. Hold your tongue, Beadle, said the second old gentleman, when Mr. Bumble had given vent to this compound adjective. I beg your worship's pardon, said Mr. Bumble, incredulous of his having heard aright. Did your worship speak to me? Yes, hold your tongue. Mr. Bumble was stupefied with astonishment. A beadle ordered to hold his tongue? A moral revolution. The old gentleman in the tortoise-shell spectacles looked at his companion. He nodded significantly. We refuse to sanction these indentures, said the old gentleman, tossing aside the piece of parchment as he spoke. I hope, stammered Mr. Limpkins, I hope the magistrates will not form the opinion that the authorities have been guilty of any improper conduct on the unsupported testimony of a mere child. The magistrates are not called upon to pronounce any opinion on the matter, said the second old gentleman sharply. Take the boy back to the workhouse and treat him kindly. He seems to want it. The same evening the gentleman in the white waistcoat most positively and decidedly affirmed not only that Oliver would be hung, but that he would be drawn and quartered into the bargain. Mr. Bumble shook his head with gloomy mystery and said he wished he might come to good, to which Mr. Gamfield replied that he wished he might come to him, which, although he agreed with the beadle in most matters, would seem to be a wish of a totally opposite description. The next morning the public were once more informed that Oliver Twist was again to let, and that five pounds would be paid to anybody who would take possession of him. Eltel says, It was disgraceful how children of the Victorian workhouses were not just starved and beaten, but bartered away so cheaply to become essentially a slave for the middle and upper classes. Yes. Yes, Eltel, it is very sad and, as you say, disgraceful. But it's in the past and... What we can do, I suppose, is look to the future, right? There's a lot of people that say that um, um, this chap I follow, Gary's Economics. I don't know if you've heard, Gary, Gary Stevenson. He's got a new book out recently, The Trading Game. I've begun listening to it, but I've listened to several of his podcasts uh, and interviews that he's done. And he's saying that we're trending in this direction. We're, we're trending towards the wealth distribution. I can't think of the word. Where the, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And that this is going to continue and the gap will widen. And it's very concerning. But it doesn't look like any of the... Even today, right? You look at today and, and again, I'm not going to uh, drift and digress into a political ramble. But if you look at, I'm in, the, I'm in England, in the UK, if you look at the two political parties, the Conservative and the Labour, they don't care about normal people, they don't care about me and my family and everyone in the village, they just care about looking after themselves, ready for their next appointment when they finish. And so I'll leave it there because I'm not going to go off ranting about the government, but a few turns and twists and we could end up back in Victorian England. So uh, there's not much that you and I can do, but <laughs> keep a lookout. Donna says, and in a supposedly God-fearing society as well, El Tell. And Donna, I think some of the worst stories come from God-fearing places, particularly um, boarding schools with 
priests and nuns at the helm, right? You hear terrible stories. <sighs> doesn't bear... Excuse me. It doesn't bear thinking about. But God-fearing, I don't think that means anything. But anyway, I won't digress into a political tirade either. Um, Kairul, you're very kind. Kairul Aman says, best reader ever. <laughs> and if you're talking about me... Very kind of you. Thank you. Eltel says, true Donna, some people can justify anything as long as God is on their side. Well, at the day of judgment, when they take their last breath, their soul will know, you know, their soul will know. And uh, anyway, but I think it's dark, right? Dickens is necessarily dark because of the time that he's writing in and the world around him so yeah it's pretty dark um stefano hello welcome stefano says it, it is true the middle class is nearly extinct and if you put your tin foil hat on i listened to a great podcast the other day again i'm gonna say check out um gary stevenson on navara media He's recently on there. They've got a YouTube channel and also James O'Brien's conversational podcast, Unfiltered or Uncensored or something. James O'Brien, Gary Stevenson, you'll find him. Check both of those out. And also on Joe Rogan, James Lindsay was there. And if you've got your tinfoil hat on, you can argue. Put your tinfoil hat on and say that maybe it's all being manufactured. But again... This isn't the time for these sorts of discussions. I'm just mentioning that, that you should go check out Gary Stevenson and also James Lindsay on Joe Rogan. And lastly, Eltel says, yeah, I should also mention that many children, unfortunately, still live this way across the world today. And I'll say one more thing, just jumping off of Eltel's comment. In America, if you're an American citizen, you're watching from America, the federal government has opened the borders up completely, the southern border. And so thousands of children are coming in, thousands of undocumented children, and they're just poof, they're just off. Where will they go? Well, it's very sad to consider, and you may say I've got a Tim Fall hat on, but it's a fact that the US southern border is open to a large degree, and they're letting thousands of individuals in a day many of them being children without their parents so for those children in america are they any different to oliver twist harsh but true i think and again i don't know what we can do about it hello there lizzie leak how much have you missed? You've missed the first three chapters, my friend. So I'm sorry, but you'll have to go back to the catch-up crew. You've missed the first three chapters, and I think this will be the last chapter because it seems like a good place to stop. And chapter the fourth is Oliver being offered another place makes his first entry into public life. So it looks like someone else is going to come back, offer some money for him, and he's going to head off and go and be with this person. And so I think this will be the last chapter of the evening. And tomorrow at 8.30 we'll be back for some more chapters. On Tuesday we'll read a chapter of Beelzebub's Tales. On Wednesday morning we'll read a chapter of Beelzebub's Tales. And on Wednesday night we'll read a chapter of Walden. So loads coming up. Uh... On that note, if you haven't already, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your like-minded, book-loving friends, and let's carry on. Hello there, Book Haven says, I have been looking for an Oliver Twist audiobook, yay. Welcome, Book Haven. Uh, share Book Club on your channel and tell everyone all about the live read of Oliver Twist. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
So, last chapter of the night, guys, because I think Slow and Steady, this book, I don't think it, I don't know, it's so good, so dense, that I don't think it's worth just reading for three hours, and by the end, you know, I'm just automatically or, you know, all the energy goes out of my, my reading. Uh, so, yeah, last chapter is a good place to stop because he's heading out into the world now. He's leaving the workhouse and now he's off with the uh, uh, the deplorables. <laughs> Chapter the fourth. Oliver, being offered another place, makes his first entry into public life. In great families, when an advantageous place cannot be obtained, either in possession, reversion, remainder or expectancy, for the young man who is growing up, it is a very general custom to send him to sea. The board, in imitation of so wise and salutary an example, took counsel together on the expediency of shipping off Oliver Twist in some small trading vessel bound to a good unhealthy port which suggested itself as the very best thing that could possibly be done with him, the probability being that the skipper would either flog him to death in a playful mood some day after dinner or knock his brains out with an iron bar both pastimes being, as is pretty generally known, very favourite and common recreations among gentlemen of that class. The more the case presented itself to the board in this point of view, the more manifold the advantages of the step appeared, so they came to the conclusion that the only way of providing for Oliver effectually was to send him to sea without delay. <laughs> Hello there, Billy Kirk. Billy Kirk says, Gary Stevenson and James O'Brien came up my on my YouTube this week. So quite the synchronicity then, Billy. You must go and watch it and tell me all about it. Um, tell me what you got from it. Send me an email, mate, if you like, because I'm, I'm really inspired by Gary, what he's doing. But sadly, I don't know, I'm getting cynical in my old age. <clears throat> Mr. Bumble had been dispatched to make various preliminary inquiries with the view of finding out some captain or other who wanted a cabin boy without any friends and was returning to the workhouse to communicate the result of his mission when he encountered just at the gate no less a person than Mr. Sowerberry, the parochial undertaker. Mr. Sowerberry was tall, gaunt, l ga <coughs> gaunt. Yeah, I know. Bookhaven, very sad. Mr. Sowerberry was a tall, gaunt... I can't say it. I can't, why can't I say gaunt? Gaunt. Take three. Mr. Sowerberry was a tall, gaunt, large-jointed man, attired in a suit of threadbare black with darned cotton stockings of the same colour and shoes to answer. His features were not naturally intended to wear a smiling aspect, but he was in general rather given to professional jocosity. His step was elastic, and his face betokened inward pleasantry as he advanced to Mr. Bumble and shook him cordially by the hand. "'I have taken the measure of the two women that died last night, Mr. Bumble,' said the undertaker. "'You'll make your fortune, Mr. Sowerberry,' said the beadle, as he thrust his thumb and forefinger into the proffered snuff-box of the undertaker, which was an ingenious little model of a patent coffin. "'I say, you'll make your fortune, Mr. Bumble,' tapping the undertaker on the shoulder in a friendly manner with his cane. "'Think so?' said the undertaker in a tone which half admitted and half disputed the probability of the event." The prices allowed by the board are very small, Mr. Bumble. So are the coffins, replied the beadle, with precise half as a great official ought to indulge in. Mr. Sowerberry was much tickled at this, as of course he ought to be, and laughed a long time without cessation. Well, well, Mr. Bumble, he said at length, there's no denying that since the new system of feeding has come in, the coffins are something narrower and more shallow than they used to be. But we must have some profit, Mr. Bumble. Well-seasoned timber is an expensive article, sir, and all the iron handles come by canal from Birmingham. 
Well, well, said Mr. Bumble, every trade has its drawbacks, and a fair profit is of course allowable. Of course, of course, replied the undertaker, and if I don't get a profit upon this or that particular article, why, I make it up in the long run, you see. <laughs> Just so, said Mr. Bumble. Though I must say, continued the undertaker, resuming the current of observations which the beadle had interrupted, though I must say, Mr. Bumble, that I have to contend against one very great disadvantage, which is, that all the stout people go off to the quickest, I mean, that the people who have been better off, and paid rates for many years, are the first to sink when they come into the house, and let me tell you, Mr. Bumble, that three or four inches over one's calculation makes a great hole in one's profits, especially when one has a family to provide for, sir. Okay, Bookhaven, take care, and see you Wednesday, hopefully, yes. As Mr. Sowerberry said this, with the becoming indignation of an ill-used man, and as Mr. Bumble felt that it rather tended to convey a reflection on the honour of the parish, the latter gentleman thought it advisable to change the subject, and Oliver Twist being uppermost in his mind, he made him his theme. "'By the by,' said Mr. Bumble, "'you don't know anybody who wants a boy, do you? A parochial Prentice, who is at present a dead weight, a millstone, as I must say, around the parochial throat. Liberal terms, Mr. Sowerberry, liberal terms. And as Mr. Bumble spoke, he raised his cane to the bill above him, and gave three distinct raps upon the words five pounds, which were printed therein in Roman capitals of gigantic size. <laughs> gigantic size. Gadzo! said the undertaker, taking Mr. Bumble by the gilt-edged lapel of his official coat. That's just the very thing I wanted to speak to you about. You know, dear me, what a very elegant button this is, Mr. Bumble. I never noticed it before. Yes, I think it is rather pretty, said the beadle, glancing proudly downwards at the large brass buttons which embellished his coat. The dye is the same as the parochial seal, the good Samaritan healing the sick and the bruised man. "'The board presented it to me on New Year's morning, "'and they made it a special verdict, I think,' said the undertaker, "'by adding some words to the effect "'that if the relieving officer had <gasps> tush, foolery, "'interposed the beadle angrily, "'if the board attended to all the nonsense "'that ignorant jurymen talk, they'd have enough to do.' "'Very true,' said the undertaker. "'They would indeed.' Juries, said Mr. Bumble, grasping his cane tightly, as was his wont when working into a passion. Juries is ineducated, vulgar, grovelling wretches. So they are, said the undertaker. They haven't no more philosophy or political economy about em than that, said the beadle, snapping his fingers contemptuously. "'No more they have,' acquiesced the undertaker. "'I despise them, said the beadle, growing very red in the face. "'So do I,' rejoined the undertaker. "'And I only wish we had a jury of the independent sort in the house for a week or two,' said the beadle. "'The rules and regulations of the board would soon bring their spirit down for them.' "'Let him alone for that,' replied the undertaker. So saying, he smiled approvingly to calm the rising wrath of the indignant parish officer. Mr. Bumble lifted off his cocked hat, took a handkerchief from the inside of the crown, wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his rage had engendered, fixed the cock's hat on again, and, turning to the undertaker, said in a calmer voice, "'Well, what about the boy?' "'Oh!' replied the undertaker. Why, you know, Mr. Bumble, I pay a good deal towards the poor's rates. Him, said Mr. Bumble. Well? Well, replied the undertaker, I was thinking that if I pay so much towards em, I've a right to get as much out of em as I can, Mr. Bumble, and so, and so, I think I'll take the boy myself. Mr. Bumble grasped the undertaker by the arm and led him into the building. Mr. Sowerberry was closeted with the board for five minutes, and then it was arranged that Oliver should go to him that evening upon liking, a phrase which means, in the case of a parish apprentice, that if the master find upon a short trial that he can get enough work out of a boy without putting too much food in him, he shall have him for a term of years 
to do what he likes with. Mm. <clears throat> Common called him forthwith. Now, Although it was very natural that the board of all people in the world should feel in a great state of virtuous astonishment and horror at the smallest tokens of want of feeling on the part of anybody, they were rather out in this particular instance. The simple fact was that Oliver, instead of possessing too little feeling, possessed rather too much, and was in a fair way of being reduced to a state of brutal stupidity and sullenness for life by the ill usage he had received. He heard the news of his destination in perfect silence and, having had his luggage put into his hand, which was not very difficult to carry inasmuch as it was all comprised within the limits of a brown paper parcel, about half a foot square by three inches deep, he pulled his cap over his eyes and once more, attaching himself to Mr. Bumble's coat cuff, was led to see that the boy was in good order for inspection by his new master, which he accordingly did with a fit and becoming air of gracious patronage. Oliver, said Mr. Bumble. Yes, sir, replied Oliver, in a low, tremulous voice. Pull that cap off of your eyes and hold up your head, sir. Oliver did as he was desired at once, and passed the back of his unoccupied hand briskly across his eyes. He left a tear in them when he looked up at his conductor. As Mr. Bumble's gazed, oh, sorry, <clears throat> As Mr. Bumble gazed sternly upon him, it rolled down his cheek. It was followed by another and another. The child made a strong effort, but it was an unsuccessful one, and withdrawing his other hand from Mr. Bumble's, he covered his face with both and wept till the tears sprung out from between his thin and bony fingers. Well, exclaimed Mr. Bumble, stopping short and darting at his little charge, a look of intense malignity. Well, of all the ungratefulest and worst disposed boys as ever I see, Oliver, you are the... No, no, sir, sobbed Oliver, clinging to the hand which the well-known cane... No, no, sir, I will be good indeed, indeed, indeed I will, sir. I'm a very little boy, sir, and it is so, so... So what? inquired Mr. Bumble in amazement. So lonely, sir, so very lonely, cried the child. "'Everybody hates me. Oh, sir, don't be cross to me. I feel as if I had been cut here, sir, and it was all bleeding away.' And the child beat his hand upon his heart and looked into his companion's face with tears of real agony. "'Oh!' That's a... Uh, just a very short phrase from Oliver there, but goodness me, if that doesn't capture... How he's feeling, right? Whoa. <laughs> Mr. Bumble regarded Oliver's piteous and helpless look with some astonishment for a few seconds, hemmed three or four times in a husky manner, and, after muttering something about that troublesome cough, bid Oliver dry his eyes and be a good boy, and, once more, taking his hand, walked on with him in silence. The undertaker had just put up the shutters of his shop and was making some entries in his day-book by the light of a most appropriately dismal candle when Mr. Bumble entered. Aha, said the undertaker, looking up from the book and pausing in the middle of a word. Is that you, Bumble? No one else, Mr. Sowerberry, replied the beadle. Here I've brought the boy. Oliver made a bow. Oh, that's the boy, is it? said the undertaker, raising the candle above his head to get a full glimpse of Oliver. Mrs. Sowerberry, will you come here a moment, my dear? Mrs. Sowerberry emerged from a little room behind the shop and presented the form of a short, thin, squeezed-up woman with a vixenish countenance. <laughs> it's an interesting... adjective, vixenish. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to read it again because I like it so much. Mrs. Sowerberry emerged from a little room behind the shop and presented the form of a short, thin, squeezed-up woman with a vixenish countenance. My dear, said Mr. Sowerberry deferentially, this is the boy from the workhouse that I told you of. Oliver bowed again. Dear me, said the undertaker's wife, he's very small. 
"'Why, he is rather small,' replied Mr. Bumble, looking at Oliver as if it were his fault that he wasn't bigger. "'He is small, there's no denying it. But he'll grow, Mrs. Sowerberry. He'll grow.' "'Ah, I dare say he will,' replied the lady, pettishly. "'On our victuals and our drink. I see no saving in parish children, not I, for they always cost more to keep than they're worth. However, men always think they know best.' "'There, get downstairs, little bag of bones.' With this, the undertaker's wife opened a side door and pushed Oliver down a steep flight of stairs into a stone cell, damp and dark, forming the ante-room to the coal cellar, and denominated the kitchen, wherein sat a slatternly girl in shoes down at heel and blue worsted stockings very much out of repair. "'Here, Charlotte,' said Mrs. Sowerberry, who had followed Oliver down, "'Give this boy some of the cold bits that were put by for trip. "'He hasn't come home since the morning, so he may go without em. "'I dare say he isn't too dainty to eat em, are you, boy?' "'Oliver, whose eyes had glistened at the mention of meat, "'and who was trembling with eagerness to devour it, "'replied in the negative, and a plateful of coarse, broken victuals was set before him. "'I wish some well-fed philosopher, whose meat and drink turned to gall within him, whose blood is ice and whose heart is iron, could have seen Oliver Twist clutching the dainty vines of the dog that the dog had neglected, and witness the horrible avidity which, with which he tore the bits asunder with all the ferocity of famine. There is only one thing I should like better, and that would be to see him making the same sort of meal himself with the same relish. Well, said the undertaker's wife, when Oliver had finished his supper, which he had regarded in silent horror, and with fearful auguries of his future appetite. Have you done? There being nothing eatable within his reach, Oliver replied in the affirmative. Then come with me, said Mrs. Sowerberry, taking up a dim and dirty lamp, and leading the way upstairs. Your bed's under the counter. You won't mind sleeping among the coffins, I suppose, but it doesn't much matter whether you will or not, for you won't sleep anywhere else. Come, don't keep me here all night. Oliver lingered no longer, but meekly followed his new mistress. <laughs> wow. Such powerful, such powerful sentences and paragraphs. Dickens, what a wonder. So that's all for this evening, um, my friends, because I just think we should slow and steady, I think. Slow and steady and, and savour it, unlike Oliver savoured his dinner there, eating the dog's leftovers that the dog wasn't eating, and Oliver's chewed them up. Goodness me, the harsh realities of life, huh? As the Buddha said, and I often say here at Book Club, the Buddha says... Life is suffering, and when we read Oliver Twist, we um, it comes through <laughs> in scores every page. So let me just see um, what's going on in the chat. And I'm sorry I have to say goodbye to so many people, but like I say, I think it's better to go slow and steady and savour it rather than rush through it because it's such an amazing book and I want to take everything I can from it so White Dwarf said it wasn't just any kids it was mainly kids from orphanages who drew the short end of the stick a boy born with two legitimate parents was pretty safe a daughter less so she had to find a husband to provide for her but an orphan was subject to a lifetime of abject poverty and technical slavery and if you're still there, White Dwarf, listening, I'm just curious. Uh, you've made a f several great points about Victorian England. Um, yeah, are you a historian? Are you just well read? Did you study Victorian England? How do you know so much and make such good points about it? So uh, I'm curious, White Dwarf, let us know. Um Bookhaven's back, so welcome back. Uh, Stefano says, My father grew up in poverty in Colombia. Born to a peasant woman out of wedlock, he often emphasised the, the importance of learning how to thrive despite being poor. Wow, I bet 
he had some stories for you there, Stefano. And again, I'm going to step away from Stefano's father because I don't want you to think that I'm talking about you and your family, but it's just made me think your comment emphasised the importance of learning to thrive despite being poor. And again, I'm coming back to Oliver now, so I'm talking about Oliver. I'm not going to be able to find it, so I don't know why I'm picking the book up trying to find the passage. But early on, it says that Oliver's spirit was what kept him going, right? The first page is where he he could have died and he was having this battle between life and death even as uh, he's just been born, he's just been birthed into the world and he's already battling for life and death. And Dickens writes that it's his spirit. He has a strong, um, a strong spirit that keeps him going and I think that's what keeps people going, isn't it? Um, again, story Stefano to say, but it's, it's a, more of a compliment than anything else. I imagine your father had a, a wonderful, strong spirit to thrive despite being poor. And many people in the world that have achieved great things or who have um, took themselves out of terrible situations must have had a, a strong spirit because those weak of spirit would just give up so again that's what i say about that and yeah i imagine uh, your father stefano has many interesting stories of his childhood and uh, i don't imagine many of them were very much fun for him so um um bookhaven Ah, Charles Dickens, an authentic and great artist. I think you're right there. Uh, Bookhaven, um, and goes on to say, I love how he makes you feel the characters. Uh, yes, he really does. And it's, yeah, he's just a, such an amazing and wonderful writer. Donna says, it's amazing how quick we as adults forget what it's like to be a child. Uh, yeah, you're right, Donna. And also, if we have children what it's like for them right sometimes if i have a, a moment of impatience or irritability upon reflection later i think it's just i don't know is it, again life is suffering as the buddha says and we're all trying to do our best going through this life doing uh, the best we can with the knowledge that we have and with our spirit and character like i've just said uh, but sometimes we feel lovely hearing Lewis read again. So I'm glad you think so. And I'm very much enjoying Dickens and looking forward to reading some more pages tomorrow. So I hope you'll all be able to join me a bit later, I think, 8.30 tomorrow for some more chapters and see where we go. Now he's living with The Undertaker. Ooh. He's gone from the workhouse and sort of solitary confinement to Mr. Um, can't even remember his name. I'm going to find his name because I'll be able to find that quite quickly because it should be right there. Mr. Sowerberry. He's going to live with Mr. Sowerberry, the undertaker, and I don't imagine it's going to be a bed of roses there. Um, good night, Stefano. Uh, you're very welcome. Soul Sister says, thank you, Lewis. Uh, you're very welcome. And I think that is what happens, isn't it? Generational trauma, it's called in the psychological literature. That's an easy term to throw out there, but that's what happens, isn't it? You grow up with significant trauma, you become an adult, that crystallizes into your soul and character, and that's how you react to the world. So necessarily, if you have a child, that's how you're going to, um, that's how you're going to do it. So A book haven says i'm going to support your channel on mine and i would appreciate that very much book haven if you do so let me know just comment on any of the videos let me know and i can check it out i'd like to see that um donna says he got man's best friend's meal instead of the workhouse slop so it's perspective that's right donna isn't it and that bit there, I'm going to read it again because it's a very powerful um, thing, how hungry he was, right? Uh, where is it? Yeah, look. Um, um, 
Well, said the undertaker's wife when Oliver had finished his supper, which she had regarded in silent horror and with fearful auguries of his future appetite. So he was very hungry, starving, and he's eating the dog food without worrying. Um, uh, yes, Bookhaven, I answered uh, tomorrow at 8.30. Soul Sister says good night, everyone, until tomorrow. Yes, uh, you're welcome, Nick Cooper. My pleasure. Um, White Dwarf said, no, Lewis, <laughs> I'm just a normal bloke from Manchester but I'm fascinated by our British history and I love literature and music from 18th, 19th century. Well, I don't know if there's such a thing as a normal bloke from Manchester, White Dwarf. I imagine there's a lot more to you, my friend. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, you've uh, commented a few times and very interesting, so I thought I'd ask, but, of course, there's a lot more to you. And uh, keep coming back, mate, and um, commenting your uh, insights because i enjoyed them very much so thanks white dwarf and nice to have you here and yeah i like the literature i don't know about music i've never explored entry music um but i like the literature uh songbird caroline songbird uh it's my pleasure there was several um several powerful quotes wasn't there caroline but none of them jumped out i mean i was very moved by many of them but we didn't get them down my fault um but such powerful writing donna harper says enjoyed as always i'm glad to hear it donna me too uh the websters say bye lewis thanks for the read it's my pleasure the websters i hope you're able to join us tomorrow for part two and um i'm sure they can book haven but this is 1850s so I don't imagine it was dog food as we understand it in a can. It would have just been food for the dog, leftover meats and stuff, victuals, as Dickens writes. So an interesting way to end, uh, dog food and tw Oliver Twist eating the dog food. But that's how chapter four ended. And so that's what we're talking about. So everyone, thanks for joining. We've got lots coming up this week. So please consider sharing the link to this or any thing that you enjoyed on book club on your social media or with your friends to help the channel grow let more people come along and as it's just part one it would be an ideal time if you know people that have been interested in reading Oliver Twist or you've got a social media following and who knows how many of your friends or followers might be interested in Oliver Twist share part one so they can jump on board early and try and keep caught up and we will be um back tomorrow and one final comment from white dwarf says good to be here i especially love your readings of marcus aurelius's meditation i never heard of it before so thanks for introducing me to it uh it's my pleasure white dwarf and i'm glad you enjoyed it and took some stoic uh teachings away from the readings because it's some of it's very powerful so I'm glad to hear that, White Dwarf, and it's great to have you here. I hope you can come back tomorrow. Um, and a lumpy horse agrees that 18th, 19th century music is gorgeous. And with that, I'll say good night, goodbye, and I'll see you tomorrow at 8.30. Look after yourselves. Have a great week. Be grateful for all that you have in this modern world. And I'll see you tomorrow for part two. Bye, guys. Take care now. See ya.